put aside any, any, anything that is distracting us or trying to keep us away from, from honing in and zoning in on you, Lord. Yeah. Mm. Father, we ask for clear reception today. Father, we ask you that you tune our frequency to, to the leading of, of your Ruach HaKodesh. So when you say jump, we don't ask how high. Or even the question. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you. 
just want to share a little bit about this, this Torah portion. Um, we were seeing earlier, and he is the all, and he is, it's like he is all of these offerings that we read about, particularly in Leviticus. Don't gloss over them, because it's all about him. It's all about him and us. And as we sang, also we draw closer, that's what offering means. It's Everything that the Lord puts before us in his word, everything that he does for us, is that we are closer and closer and closer and closer to him. So it says, the burnt offering shall be on the heart, upon the altar all night until morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. The burnt offering is the Ola offering, which means it goes up to the Lord. When somebody is blessed to come up to read from the, from the Torah and, and see the, or sing the blessings, it's making Aliyah, it's coming up. And when one goes back to Jerusalem, they make Aliyah, they go up, they ascend unto the Lord. And this Ola offering is a sweet, sweet aroma to the Lord. And the first time, it's such a beautiful blessing to see the first time a word is used in Hebrew and Scripture. And Ola, the first time is when Noah, after all the time in the ark, all, all the waters, when the Lord then brought them to dry ground, and they came out of the ark. No, without the instruction being written down, without the instruction in, in real time, like in our time, being given to Moses and then being written for us, Noah does the very thing that is commanded in these Torah portions that we've been recently reading that were given many, many, many years later. So Noah built an altar to the Lord and took a very clean animal and a very clean bird and offered burnt offerings, offered the Ola offerings unto the Lord, which again, draws him near to the Lord, draws us near to the Lord. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma that the Lord said in his heart, the covenant he makes with Noah, the covenant he makes with us, it's so tied to that offering. I will never again curse the ground for man's sake, although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. And back to this Torah portion. He shall put on his body and take up the altar of the burnt offering. And he shall put them beside the altar. Then he shall take off his garments, put on other garments, and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. Thank you, Father. All week, as I was conjuring, I was seeing, you know, we're in the tabernacle. It's like that the tabernacle is within our, within our heart. The altar is in our heart. Yeshua dwells there. And in these words, I, I kept seeing, as best as I could, more of more a sense. And I can't really explain it, but you should. But in, in my heart, in, in your heart, doing these things, not these things, because these things are, you know, they're, they're for us to sort of understand and, and more for the children of Israel to do, and to then receive from the Lord in those ways, the spiritual ways that we truly can't understand. But the little bit that we can, just seeing him do that, the care, that Yeshua, our high priest, being enacted by, by Aaron for the for the first time on the earth for the children of Israel. Imagine that. Imagine experiencing that on the earth, but then knowing that Yeshua is doing those very things within, within our hearts. And just the care. Then he shall take off his garments, put on other garments, and then take the ashes. So those the whole burnt offerings, which is what this, this piece of scripture is about, the whole animal is, is consumed by the fire. The skin is taken off and given to the priests. But the whole animal is consumed. And the ashes, from what I understand, are, are from the fat of the animal, primarily. And that can be you know, related to stuff that we don't need in our lives. And I was thinking earlier when we were, we were dancing, I'm pretty good at multitasking. I think there's others that are much better than I am because I observe that. And you know, when you're talking to someone and you're doing other things, and you know they're listening, you know, and, and the Lord blesses us with the ability to do many things, but really, it's not so much a blessing because all those multitasking ways take our attention off of the thing or the person. Who, and I know you know this, but you know, I, I need to be reminded of it. You know, and, and those are the things that the enemy twists or are twisted in, on the, in our human ways so that we take our eyes off the Lord. <laughs> And I need to improve in that so much. And that just spoke so deeply to my heart just a few minutes ago 
that my eyes need to be so focused on him. And so we can, just like when, when the um, children of Israel were, were following the Lord's instructions to do these things with the offerings, they didn't really know exactly what they were doing or why they were doing it, but they were doing it, right? Because the Lord commanded it, and then that is such a blessing. And it's like right now, whatever I'm doing, I have to do this thing, and I need to put my focus on that one thing. And that's going to take a little bit of time because we're in this world that's spinning around so fast that it's, it's harder and harder to focus on that one thing. Okay, bless the Lord. But, but when you think about that in relation to the care that the high priest took, that Yeshua takes with us, such a blessing. The next time that Ola offering is appears in Scripture is um, with, with Abraham. When the Lord says to Abraham, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will tell you. So when they're going up to the mountain, Isaac says, I see the wood, I see that he's carrying the fire, the fire of the Lord. And Isaac says, But where's the animal? And Abraham says, The Lord himself will provide the lamb. For the burnt offering. And we know that he does, and we know that Isaac is a symbol of the Messiah, again, of that burnt offering. That Yeshua is all the offerings, every single one of the offerings. Yes. Back to this Torah portion, and the fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. That's said, I believe, three times in this Torah portion, that the fire on the altar shall be kept burning. And it's the priest, it's Yeshua within us that keeps the fire burning in our hearts. It shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it. Again, the care that Yeshua takes within our hearts. He shall burn wood on it every morning, and lay the burnt offering in order on it. And he shall burn the fat of the peace offering. The fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. Wow. And I don't like to Christianize Hebraic things, but it does appear to be that in Acts 1-9, when Yeshua had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up. And the word in Hebrew, we don't have actual translations of the New Testament yet discovered, as far as I know, in Hebrew. But the word is translated when there are Hebrew translations into Olah. So when Yeshua, and we can see that. I mean, we can see the fact that Yeshua rises. He ascends. He ascends as the perfect offering, the perfect sweet savor, aroma of the Lord. Oh, I some church theologies that I'm actually not very familiar with. So there's a little bit of a story. I've shared this before. It was a couple of years ago where a pastor who I never met contacted me <coughs> and asked me if um, I could go to his church and speak on Palm Sunday. And I said, you know, not, not on Palm Sunday, speak about Palm Sunday. So I said, yes. 
But one question. What's Palm Sunday? <laughs> and he goes, what's Palm Sunday? You know, it's the beginning of Holy Week. And I said, okay, good. <laughs> what's Holy Week? <laughs> <laughs> So then he explains what, what it is, and then I said, aha, I understand it, and wouldn't you know it, even that from a Jewish perspective there is an answer, and there is a teaching, and since Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday, is tomorrow, right? I'll do a little bit of a teaching on Palm Sunday to start. So today on the Jewish calendar is a, a very special Shabbat, and it is called Shabbat HaGadol, which is the great Sabbath. It's always the Sabbath before Passover. So what event does today, Shabbat HaGadol, celebrate? So let me go back to Torah. And I'm going to read something from Exodus, which is what happened on, back then, the Shabbat before Passover. The day can turn out to not be on the Sabbath, but it's celebrated on the Sabbath before Passover every year in Judaism. And it is the following, from Exodus 12, 3. On the tenth day of this month, that's the first month, that's the month we're in. On the tenth day of this month, they are each to take for themselves a lamb to their father's house, a lamb for each house. So this is the time that all of the families of Israel took a lamb into their home in preparation for Passover, which is in a few days where that little lamb gets slain and eaten for Passover. So, on the 10th day of this month, so the 10th day, what day? Ten. On the first month, this happens. What goes in? Uh, Lamb. Goes where? In house. Which house? The what? The what? The, the, the lamb. lamb goes where? The beach house. The beach house, that's funny. The lamb goes where? To the father's house. The lamb goes to the father's house. Father's house. Father's house. Amen. Getting it so far? Yeah. 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 Goes to the father's house. Father's house. Okay. So here is what um, um, fulfills it in the New Testament. So these are things that you would just miss if you don't have a Hebrew mindset and a Torah-based mindset. John 12, verses 1 through 11, speaks about a dinner. And John writes, Yeshua, therefore, six days before Passover... Six days before Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, and they made him dinner. This is the dinner when Yeshua and Lazarus and Mary and Miriam, they had a dinner together, and Mary, you know, anointed his feet with the perfume, the expensive perfume, and, and uh, Judas said, what are you doing? That could be used for the poor. You know the story, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's all John 12, 1 through 11. When did it happen? Six days before Passover. Passover is when? Passover is on the 15th day of the month. The lambs are slain at the evening of the 14th, and then we come to the 15th. That is day one of Passover. Okay? So if Passover is on the 15th of the month, and this dinner happened six days before Passover, what day of the month did the dinner happen? The ninth of the month. The ninth? The day before this event. Correct? Amen. Amen. What does John 12 start with? Therefore, therefore, the dinner took place on the ninth of the month. So if that all took place, John 12, verses 1 through 11, John 12, verse 12 starts with, the next on the next day, the tenth of the month, the large crowd who comes to the feast took the branches of the palm trees and began to shout, Oceana! Answer us. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's Palm Sunday. That happens.
happened on the exact same day that the lamb goes into the father's house. On the exact same day that the lamb is taken into the homes, Yeshua, the lamb of God, comes into Jerusalem, his father's house, on the exact same day. Matthew continues on what happened immediately following the palm thing with the donkeys. He continues, and Yeshua entered the temple and drove out who were the buying and selling. That all happened on the 10th day of the month. The day that the lamb went where? The father's house. Yeshua goes into his father's house. In fact, the prophet's reading, uh, the uh, Jewish people have a reading, not just a Torah reading, but a pro prophet reading from the books of the prophets called the Haf Torah reading. And the Haf Torah reading is from Malachi 3, which says, Behold, I'm coming to send my messenger. He will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. That is read also on this day, today. And that is the day that Yeshua enters into the temple. Wow, hallelujah. So all of that is really the biblical fulfillment of Hamsa. It all, once again, goes back to Torah. All of it. If, if, you, if you're able to see in the New Testament, in the Brit Kadashah, how, how much the New Testament is based on the old. It, it, it will blow you away. You know, you can, we can eat fruit from the from the store, and it's it's held, and it's good, and it's and it's it's shiny, and it's tasty, and we lose the sense of how it was once connected to a tree, which was connected to the roots. And the New Testament is like the fruit. It's like the spiritual. It has to be connected to the root. And when it's connected to the root, there's amazing things that, that come out. Uh, there's one story, I'm going to share it. It's, it's, it's one of those wonderful little mysteries, hints in the New Testament, how, how much it's connected to Torah in such detailed ways. Okay? There is a story. Uh, this is after Yeshua uh, died and rose again. Now, we learn the characters, because we read the Bible so much, we, we learn the characters, we know a little bit about the characters, we know about Peter, we know he was a fisherman, you know, and we know also about John. The Bible speaks about the Apostle John, and how Yeshua loved him, but I don't know if you realize this, that it also says that John was a descendant of a high priest. It specifically says that in Acts 4. It says that uh, the Caiaphas and Annas were there, along with John, who was the descendant of the high priest. And there's this one time um, during Yeshua's trial when the high priest brought Yeshua into his office, right, to his chamber. And John was able to go in because he was known by the high priest, it says, but Peter wasn't allowed in until John said, he's with me, and then he was allowed. Do you understand that? Yeah. So he was, he was a high priest. That made him a Sadducee. Okay, so he was part of the priestly family, John. So now we have the story. Yeshua is resurrected. Uh, Miriam, Mary comes running to the disciples and says, the Lord's body is not in the tomb. So then they start, Peter and John start to book it, right? So they start running towards the tomb. And apparently John was a little faster because he got there first. Peter, I guess, was a little out of shape. Yeah. You know, he's lagging behind, huffing and puffing. And it says, John gets to the tomb and stopped at the edge of the tomb and, and waited. Peter finally. Yeah.
that. You'll stay away from that. So even something as simple as that, a simple little narrative that we can overlook about them running to the tomb, has its root in the Torah. And I believe this is the day, this is the time, that the Lord is reconnecting the fruit to the root. And he's bringing forth the realization of how Jewish the New Testament is. And I'm going to keep saying it until God says to me, don't say it no more. But I believe that we are in a time of great revival. And it's going a part of this revival is going to be the realization of the Hebrew roots of this thing, of this Jewish roots of this thing. That it's gonna become much more widespread than it is right now. And I believe, like I said, and I'm gonna keep saying it, God says don't say it no more. The Torah is like the roots, it's like the ground. Yes. And the things of the spirit are like the fruit. He's 
about to pour out wine. And he's always pouring out new wine. He's always pouring out new wine. He's always pouring out new wine. The challenge is the receiving of the new wine because of our wineskins. And we know the parable, and I don't think everybody fully understands the parable. There's a couple things that Yeshua was doing just before those parables. Number one, he was eating with sinners. He was eating with tax collectors, and the Pharisees were saying, why are you eating with these sinful people? He was being challenged on who he was hanging out with, on who he was rolling with. of Yochanan, the immerser, John the Baptist, they were all fasting. So apparently there was a Jewish fast happening. I don't know what it was. I don't think it was Yom Kippur. It was probably, it was some other rabbinically mandated fast. And they were all fasting and they went to Yeshua and they said, why aren't your disciples fasting? So number one, he challenged the Pharisees and who to hang out with. It went against their paradigm of who to hang out with. Number one. Number two, he challenged their man-made traditions. And he had his disciples eat. And then he says two things, and this is really, really, really important. He said, you don't put a new patch on a ripped old garment. Because what happens when you wash it? The old garment is shrunk as far as it's going to go. But the new patch is going to shrink. And it's going to make the, the tear even worse. And you say, you don't put new wine into old wineskins. Why? Because the old wineskins are expanded to the point that they can expand no more. So when the wine ferments and starts to bubble up and expand, the wineskins are going to break. So you only put the new wine into new wine skins. So what is the old garment? And what is the old wine skins? And what is, where is Yeshua in this? Well, Yeshua is the new patch, right? Because we're, we're an old ripped garment and Yeshua comes in with a patch. And we're like an old wine skin and Yeshua comes in with new wine. But what does this mean? What he's saying, and what he's saying to the Pharisees, and what he's saying to us, is that the ways of God you must, in yourself, have the ability to expand and contract. You cannot stop the growth or the shrinking that the Holy Spirit wants to accomplish in you. The Pharisees at that time, were stuck in their ways, and they could not, when the new one comes in, they could not expand. And there are things in us, in us that the Lord wants to shrink in us. There are things that the Lord wants to die in us. There's pride that needs to die. And when the Yeshua, the patch comes on, it starts to shrink, and he tries to shrink us, we have to be flexible with the way the Lord is working in us. We have to be able to grow or shrink as the new wine comes in. Because if we don't, and we remain hard and hard-hearted to what the Lord is doing within us, the vessel will break and the wine will be wasted. But when we have new wineskins, which means when we are able to grow when he wants us to grow. Listen, we love the plans of God. We love the plans of God. We love what God is doing. We love the plans in our life, the future, the hope. We love all these things. What we don't love is the way he wants to get us there. That's where we become hard. Because we see where we are, and we see the promises, and we have a really good idea of how to get there.
there. But God has different ideas. And when we become hard to it, we are old wineskins. When he wants to shrink us and we don't allow the process to happen, we're the old garment. We have to be receptive to the way the Lord wants to fulfill the promises in our lives. And when we have the ability to step back and put away our own desires, you know, the children of Israel had a really good way of getting from Egypt to the promised land. It's right there. Let's go. God had a little bit of a different idea. Mm. <laughs> to breathe out, to breathe in. <laughs> if I just have, nope, 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 eighteen hundred dollars, not, not going to do it. I never thought that it would be on the Torah portion of, of Teruma when everybody just gave and it was more than enough. I never <laughs> had the thought that I would just have a heart for it to give. I'm only going to take a one offering. And three times the amount came in. But this, this was never on, in my plan. Never in my plan. But if I was not flexible enough to say, okay, I have a vision for what the gift looks like, but how it gets executed by God is, is entirely different. And for me to be open to the way God is going to work in this thing. If I was not open to it, we wouldn't have this little guy. Big guy. There are two areas that, that Yeshua spoke to uh, the Pharisees. One, who they hung out with. And two, their man-made traditions. And Yeshua's got no problem going up his sideways with those things. Yeah. I'll tell you, you know, one, one thing I love about Mishkan David, I, I just love about congregations, and, and you know, we go through these times, I know in our lives, we're like, you know what, I'm not going to go to a congregation anymore. I'm going to just sit at home, and I'm going to watch the guys on the internet. You know, and I'm going to, you know, join the chat rooms, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, I'm, you know, and, we, and it's okay. We go through seasons where we're like, you know, we're not... In doing that, you are new garments. 
If you just leave because somebody upsets you, you just set yourself up for it again because God is faithful to have these things within you become exposed. I said last week that what happens in the month of Adar is underground and what happens in this month in the month of Nisan is revealed out publicly. So the things that God works within you, the things that the plan that he's working in you in Adar is about to come forth. But also the things that he's working on you to destroy within you, to kill, to die within you. He also is faithful to bring that up to the light so it can be dealt with. And that, when you submit to that process, that is new wineskins because the Lord is pouring into you and you are allowing the wine to expand. You are allowing the growth. You are allowing the wineskins to be stretched. Are you feeling stretched? Amen. God may be pouring new wine into you. So if you don't submit to it, you are an old wineskin and the skin will be destroyed and the wine will be lost. When God stretches us, we, sub we have to submit to that. Let me explain what happens in congregations. It's an amazing, divine thing. So uh, God gave me once a vision for congregations, how it says that we're living stones. You know where it says, like, we're living stones in the house of the Lord. And I was thinking, like, what is a living stone? Well, a stone is, is like, I don't know, it's, it's shaped a certain way. But it's shaped that way forever. That's a regular stone. A living stone is breathing, and it's morphing. And they have a congregation where all these living stones, they're all shaped and colored a little bit differently. They're all kind of stacked up. Now here comes somebody else into the congregation, <laughs> and they're shaped like a square. And here they come. And they're like, hallelujah, here I come into the congregation. There better darn well be a place for me, because I'm a square. <laughs> and if there isn't one right now, you better make a because this is what I have to bring to you. And I need to click into there. And then all of a sudden the square, you know, is trying to fit in and it's just kind of hitting rocks. You know, all of a sudden the square is going, what's happening here? This place. What's the word? Squelches the Holy Spirit? Is that the word people say? Quenches. Is that, that good or bad? That's bad. What's bad? Quench the Holy Spirit? They quench the Holy Spirit. They're not receiving me. Oh. Hallelujah. <laughs> and they leave. But when the square, when the square submits to the stretching process, because we are a congregation of living stones, which means you may look like a square today, but Adonai is stretching you into something else. Or he's shrinking you into something else. He may be stretching you like the wineskins. He may want to shrink you like the garment. But when we submit to that, instead of just leaving, all of a sudden, and this is what I love about congregational life, here or other places, all of a sudden, because the living stones start to, you know, because we're always moving, you know, and it's shifting. And then you were once shaped like a square. All of a sudden, your edges start to smooth out. And you start to develop little bumps here and little curves here. And what you thought you came into this place with at some point ago, you're like, they better accept me. All of a sudden, you're shaped a little bit differently. And if you let that process of expanding and shrinking happen, all of a sudden, in the right time, you fit right in. Because we're all in this process of growing and, and twisting and reshaping. And the biggest detriment, the biggest blockage to receiving the new wine that God has, the biggest blockage is your stubbornness and your, your inability to shrink and to expand along with the Spirit of God. So if you're being stretched in your life, good. If you're being stretched, good. If you're feeling the stretch and the Good. That is what happens to new life.
instincts. If you're feeling there's a part of you that is shrinking, there's a part of you that you held on to and it's shrinking, and you don't know why it's shrinking. Good. Good. Hang in there. That's because Yeshua, the patch, patched you up. And now it's going through the process of shrinking. I'm telling you, it's this that prevents people from understanding what God's doing. And that's why Yeshua was with these delicates for the Pharisees. Like, they, 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 they had such a, an understanding of, in their own mind of what this is going to look like. Well, Judaism, that's going to be spread across the world. All of a sudden, God is like pouring out his spirit on these Gentiles over here. And they're like, huh? Huh? And they can either walk away from it or they can realize that God's doing something. And God is expanding their wide skins. We are at a time right now that God is very, very much looking for wide skins that are willing to expand. And looking for garments that are willing and able to shrink. And expand and contract along with the will of God. Are you willing to go through this process of expansion and shrinking down according to the will of God? In this time, in this hour, he is going to be challenging you on many things that you've held so sacred, theologies that are so sacred, ways of life that are so sacred, but God is so faithful because he loves you so much, he is going to stretching in these matters. And if you submit to what God wants to do, then you will grow along with him and be a vessel for the new wine. And he is pouring out new wine. All the time. All the time. All the time. All the time. <coughs> so don't just pray away. The times of stretching. It ain't gonna work anyway. You can avoid it, and he'll just bring it back. Because if he's gonna pour into you and you're gonna stretch, he's gonna keep doing it and doing it. <laughs>